Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Matt G and today I'm going to be talking about lift. Now this video by no means includes all the items that are involved in the lift production process, but from a pilot's perspective, I'm going to be talking about a few basic principles that will help us understand better how and why an airplane flies. So for example, if you were asked on your check ride, explain to me about lift, this is something you could say. Now try to follow along with this explanation as best as you can, and I'm going to go through at the end and explain each section in more detail. Well, lift is a part of the total aerodynamic force that acts on an airfoil, in our, or, or in our case, the wing of an airplane, and this aerodynamic force acts perpendicular to the flight path. So for example, if this airplane was flying along in straight and level flight, lift would act perpendicular to the flight path and would be pushing in the upward direction enabling the aircraft to overcome the force of gravity and fly. Now lift is mainly produced by a pressure difference between the upper surface of the wing and the lower surface of the wing. There's faster moving air over the upper surface of the wing. And the reason this air is moving faster is because of something called the law of continuity which states that as the area of a flowing fluid decreases the velocity must increase. And since there's a greater cross-sectional area on the upper surface of the wing, the area that the air has to flow is reduced. This causes the velocity of the air to increase. Now Bernoulli's principle states that when velocity of a, of a flowing fluid increases, there is a corresponding decrease in the static pressure, or in other words, the pressure that is pushing down on the upper surface of the wing. So we have a faster velocity creating a lower pressure and the, high, the relatively higher pressure on the bottom of the wing pushes up and helps create lift. In addition to this, there's also Newton's third law can be taken into account, which states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so as air comes and hits the bottom of the wing, it is deflected in the downward direction. And the equal and opposite reaction would be an upward force contributing to the total lift production process. Also, as we've stated before, there's faster moving air over the top of the wing, and when this faster moving air collides with the slower moving air from the bottom of the wing, that too produces an upward and forward force contributing to the lift making process. All right, follow that? Now let's explain things in a little more detail. The first thing we're going to talk about is Newton's third law. And if you could imagine this right here being the side view of the wing of an airplane, kind of like this flying through the air and these ping pong balls in my hand would be air particles we could see something like this that as the wing is coming through the air and the air particles are hitting it you can see they are deflected in the downward direction and the equal and opposite force would be in the upward direction now how would this look on the board well we could draw the side view of an airfoil or in our case a wing and in the training aircraft that we fly, the smaller aircraft, we typically have a flatter bottom surface and a rounded or, or a, a curved or cambered upper surface. Now the airflow, as we stated before, shown here in orange, is coming in the horizontal direction here, striking the bottom surface of the wing being deflected downwards, just like those ping pong balls. And the equal and opposite reaction shown here in green would be in the upward direction. Also, we have faster moving air over the top of the wing, and when this faster moving air, shown in blue, collides with the slower moving air, shown in orange, the equal and opposite reaction that we can show in pink here would be in the forward and upward direction, helping contribute to the total production of lift of that airplane. And that's the, basic, the basics of Newton's third law and the lift production process. But as I said before, the main part of lift comes from the pressure difference between the upper surface and the lower surface of the wing. And to understand that better, we're going to talk about Bernoulli, not the pasta, the Swiss mathematician. So, as I said before, you might have heard the word static pressure. And before we talk about Bernoulli, we're going to talk about the two different kinds of pressure, and that is static pressure and dynamic pressure. Now, static pressure is like this. If I have this bottle of water, the fluid inside is putting pressure on the outside walls of the bottle that surrounds it. We know this to be true because if I were to take a nail or something and poke a hole in the side of the bottle, 
the internal pressure would push that still fluid out to the outside. So if we were to draw that on the board, static pressure would look something like this. If we had a circular container with still fluid in it, that fluid would be exerting pressure on the outside walls of whatever surrounds it. Okay? So that's static pressure. And you can think static or still. Now dynamic pressure is a little something different. I like to think of this like a garden hose. If you've ever taken a garden hose and put your thumb over the end of it and tried to spray somebody, you can feel that increase in pressure pushing against your thumb. Well, if we have a pipe right here and we're pumping any kind of fluid through it, the fluid is going to be flowing in this direction, in the forward direction, and it's going to be exerting a force in that forward direction. This is the dynamic pressure. You would be able to realize the dynamic pressure or measure it if I were to stick my hand in the middle of this pipe and that fluid was to be pushing against my hand in the forward direction, that would be a realization of the dynamic pressure. Now it's also important to notice that just because there's some dynamic pressure doesn't mean there's no static pressure. There still is pressure being exerted against the walls of this container here, just not as much. Because the faster this fluid flows, the less pressure it puts on the outside walls of whatever it is that surrounds it. Now, Bernoulli's formula simply states, after we just understood these two different kinds of pressure, Bernoulli stated that static pressure plus dynamic pressure equals a constant, which means that as static pressure goes up, dynamic pressure must go down and vice versa. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, wait a minute, is, is there some kind of mathematical explanation for this? Did Bernoulli actually write a mathematical formula to explain this? And why, yes, he did, and I have it written down right here, I can show you. The P, this is the static pressure, and all this jargon right here, that's dynamic pressure. So we have P, or static pressure, plus one-half times that's the Greek letter rho, and that stands for air density, times the velocity squared. Now, I have good news for you, and that is that the air density does not change much for flows much below the speed of sound. So essentially, we could cover up the air density and just look at it as the static pressure plus one-half times the velocity equals a constant. So we know that just based on the velocity of a fluid, as the velocity goes up, the pressure that that fluid puts on the walls around it must go down. Now, is there some kind of real world example that I could give of this? Absolutely, there, certain, there certainly is. If I have a piece of paper right here, there's static atmospheric pressure all around this paper on the upper and lower surface. But if I were to accelerate the air, over the top of it or increase the velocity, there would be a corresponding decrease in static pressure or the pressure that's pushing down on the upper surface of this paper, leaving more static pressure pushing in the upward direction and helping to push this paper up, like so. See, it's not magic, it's Bernoulli. Want to see that again? I'll give you a close up. As I accelerate the air over the top of this paper, I'm increasing the velocity hence increasing the dynamic pressure and decreasing the static pressure or the pressure that the air is pushing down against this paper. And that is a perfect real world example of how Bernoulli's principle works. Now, it's important to note that Bernoulli's principle does not explain why the airflow speeds up. It simply explains that when it does, there will be a corresponding decrease in pressure. To understand why the airflow speeds up, we have to look at something called the law of continuity. And the law of continuity simply states that air density times area times velocity equals a constant. Or, in other words, as we said before, for us in the smaller training aircraft going much below the speed of sound, the air density doesn't really change much. So we can neglect that in our formula, which leaves us with area times velocity equals a constant. 
So to realize this or to see this better in a drawing, if we had a pipe that went from a larger area to a smaller area and then back to a larger area, what would be the corresponding values of area and velocity of whatever fluid we have flowing through here? Well, in brown, we'll have the area, say, at 10. And the velocity in blue, we'll say, would also be 10. Now, as the area that the, the fluid has to flow through decreases, let's say the area decreases to 5, the velocity must in turn increase. We'll say it goes up to 15. And of course, on the other side, we are back to 10 and 10. So as the area that a fluid has to flow through decreases, the velocity must increase. And also, going back to Bernoulli's principle of static and dynamic pressure, if we were to hook up a pressure gauge to the outside of the larger and the narrower parts of this Venturi tube, we would see that the pressure, which is really the static pressure or the pressure pushing against the walls of this Venturi pipe, the pressure would be, oh, let's make up a number and say 10 <clears throat> in the larger area. And when the area that the flow has to, the, the area that the fluid has to flow through is decreased, the pressure would also decrease, let's say to 5. And then, of course, back to 10 when it goes back into a larger area. Now, now that we understand why a fluid flows up, why a fluid speeds up, and the pressure difference that corresponds to that, we can show this in a real world example. And let's go back to our friend, Mr. Airfoil. So, if we have an airfoil or the side view of a wing, like so, and we were to take a line and draw it from the trailing edge all the way up through the leading edge, we would have something that looks kind of like this. And this is called, this is what we refer to as the cord line. And at low angles of attack, <coughs> the where the cord line goes through the leading edge of the airfoil or the wing, that's about at the same area on the wing where when air particles are coming and flowing over the airfoil, they hit and some go over the airfoil and everything above that goes over the airfoil and at that point some go underneath the airfoil and all the air underneath that would also go underneath. That's referred to as the stagnation point. And so if we were to crosshatch the upper surface or the, the, the upper section of the wing we'll do that in blue, we would see it looks something like this. And if we were to cross hatch, we'll say in orange, the lower surface of the wing, it would look something like this. Now, if I was to go directly in front of this airfoil, right about at the stagnation point, which is the point where the air, air, air flow hits and some goes over the airfoil and some goes under, if I was to go right here and say, okay, there's air moving here, air particles, and they're flowing in this direction. They have this much area to flow in. Now, watch what happens as I move my hands back and the airfoil goes through that air. You see what's above my right hand right here? There's no longer area for, for the air to flow because there's an airfoil. So the area that the, the effective area that the air has to flow is then reduced to here. So we see in front of the airfoil, there's this much area, then we come back and the distance between my hands drops, the area is reduced, therefore, by the law of continuity, the velocity must increase. And when the velocity increases, according to Bernoulli's principle, the static pressure, in turn, must decrease because of the increase in dynamic pressure. Now, one last thing before we conclude this presentation, and that is that that is, I want to explain why at a higher angle of attack or when you pull the nose of the airplane back and the wings go like this, at a higher angle of attack there is an even greater pressure differential and more lift is created. And here's the reason for that. If we were to draw an airfoil 
at a low angle of attack, or let's say pretty close to a zero angle of attack, and we have our chord line, which is roughly about where the stagnation point is at low angles of attack, the upper surface of the wing, shown here in orange, would be like so. And the lower surface of the wing, we'll show that in blue, would be about right here. But it's important to note that when you increase the angle of attack of an airfoil, or you pull it up, that the stagnation point actually moves down the leading edge. So the court line would be in the same spot, from the trailing edge to the leading edge, like so. But the stagnation point, which I'll show here in blue, is no longer around the chord line, but it's actually further down the leading edge, say right here. Now the effective area that the airflow sees is based on the stagnation point, because this is what the air sees. I'm going to draw a line from the back edge, not following the chord line, but to the stagnation point, because all the air above the stag all the air above the stagnation point is flowing over the top of the airfoil, and conversely, the airflow on the bottom side of the stagnation point is going underneath the airfoil. So if you can see, there's this extra amount of area that's being taken up by the upper surface of the wing. And I'll show that in orange right here. And also, the lower surface of the wing, shown here in blue, would be like so. And so, as the angle of attack increases, or the airfoil is pulled up, the stagnation point moves down, leaving an even greater amount of surface area in this airfoil as opposed to this airfoil, causing a even greater increase in velocity, and because of Bernoulli's principle, this greater increase in velocity translates to a decrease in the static pressure, or the pressure that's pushing down against the wind. Now, this principle also explains why an airfoil or an airplane can fly upside down. Some people say, hey, wait a minute, you can't use the law of continuity and Bernoulli's principle to explain why an airfoil can fly upside down. I say, touche. I think you can, and I'm going to try. So, as we have an airfoil upside down like this, somebody say they roll an airplane, all you would have to do to get this airfoil to be able to fly upside down would be to increase the angle of attack, or decrease depending on which way you look at it, or pull this lower surface of the wing up enough so that the stagnation point moves down from the cord line on the leading edge, and it moves down enough when you increase the angle of attack that the stagnation point would then create a larger surface area on the upper side and a smaller surface area on the bottom side. Now if I have the cord line here and the stagnation point here, I can draw an orange, the upper surface, here, and that would be a greater area than the lower surface of the wing, shown here in purple. And that's how an airfoil can fly upside down. Not that I've ever flown upside down before, or ever will again. That concludes this presentation on lift. Thanks for joining me, everybody. And join me next time when my next video comes out for not one, not two, but three different ways to tie down an airplane. Take it easy and fly safe.